I'm here today to introduce you to Pilchuck Glass School here in Stanwood, Washington as a part of a celebration of Pilchuck's 50th anniversary. This school is dedicated to glass making and fine art production here in the Pacific Northwest. Artists travel to Pilchuck from around the world to learn and experiment. Museum of Glass and Pilchuck are two great institutions that are currently collaborating on an exhibition of work by artists that have had artist residencies at each institution called What Are You Looking At? This exhibition was co-curated by Ben Wright, Creative Director at Pilchuck, and Ben Cobb, Hotshot Director at Museum of Glass. We're so lucky to have a behind the scenes look here at Pilchuck today. Artistic Director Ben Wright has given us access to the facilities, artists, and studios. How did Pilchuck get started? Pilchuck has a really interesting origin myth. Um, as you can see, we're in the middle of a tree farm here. And in 1971, so almost exactly 50 years ago, uh, Dale Chihuly and Ruth Tamara um, decided to set up a glass blowing program um, that focused almost as much in surviving and thriving in the woods and wilderness and self-sufficiency as it did on glass making. And uh, over the 50 years, we've grown into this international school here. Uh, but even Dale admits that he had no idea this is where things were going when he, when he set out here. Can you tell us about curating what are you looking at with Bing Cobb and what it means for Pilchuck to be part of this exhibition? Yeah, well, we'll start with the title, what are you, what are you looking at? We're really trying to get um, visitors to the museum to look at the material without all of the assumptions that people bring to glass. So this specifically is a group of artists that really stretch the boundaries from fashion to furniture to um, installation art to sculpture. Um, they use the material in a lot of different ways. Um, the ability to work with Ben Cobb, who has been at the museum for so long and actually physically made so many of these objects for these artists is just is a really rare opportunity. The insight that he had into you know his discussions with the artists, but also just the act of making is is a really is a really nice sort of behind the scenes access that is that is rare for a curator. What wasn't quite apparent to me when we first started com uh, our conversations was we actually have uh, similar tastes and our minds go to similar places. So as we looked at uh, our roster of artists who have come through here and Pilchuck and we sort of compared notes, you know, we wrote down like our wish list of artists that we'd like to see in the, sh in the show and they pretty well matched up. So from, from an aesthetic point of view and um, and from a conceptual point of view, we're actually aligned pretty well, which was which was awesome. And um, I like to think there's a you know we we got on pretty good. So I like Ben. I think he likes me. Um, yeah, it was a good time. You know, and uh, again, we we tried to put this show together uh, during the pandemic, so a lot of work uh, was done done at home and, and remotely. But um, pretty proud of uh, the end result. And you know, when they come to the museum and they have their residency, the visitors to the museum, even in the pieces that they leave behind, only get a snapshot of what that artist does. So the idea behind this show is to pair some of those pieces that the museum has in their collection from these residencies with the videos of the artists talking about those pieces and their intentions in their own words with pieces that represent the artist's larger practice. So what do you feel is the importance of the Museum of Glass and Pilchuck's current partnership and how do you feel it will further the glass movement? Well, I think it's been a really rich partnership, goes back about 18 years um, as this exhibition at the museum shows. Um, and it was uh, just, hey, what if? How can we partner? What does that look like? And it started um, with looking at their roster and their artist in residence program during the summer and inviting um, a certain amount of those folks down to the museum either before or after their time at Pilchuck. And what that did for us was give us access to artists that um, were not on our radar or we weren't on their radar. Um, so it exposed them to a different aspect of, of glass making down here than they experienced at Pilchuck. Uh, it's, it helped us network so they had 
hopefully they had a good time here and they told their friends in, in the art world. So their ability to come up here for a couple weeks and be immersed in this atmosphere and really experiment with the material, when they get down to the museum and get to work with that amazing team, Ben Cobb and, and all of those folks, um, they already sort of have an understanding of the material so they can really take it better advantage of the skill set um, that they're provided with at the museum and those amazing facilities down there. So it's, it's really kind of a best case scenario for the artists. As organizations, it allows us to cast our net even further and invite international artists by sort of sharing some of the costs of bringing those artists here to the Pacific Northwest. What also are the plans for the next 50 years? Well, we're in a really interesting position now where the, the founding members are still with us and still very much involved in the school, um, but it's really exciting to see new generations of glass artists come up. <laughs> I think and now we're good. going to Buster's Cabin. That's right. Okay, cool. So I saw this this on like a top 50 like uh, tree houses of America. I'd say, magazine. I'd say top 10. <laughs> Yeah, this was built uh, about the same time as Dale's that we looked at. You can see a lot of similar um, dump windows employed in the fabrication of this cabin. Uh, Buster's a very interesting um, artist. He's a very prolific uh, public art um, public artist in Seattle and the Pacific Northwest particularly. For the first couple years of, of Pilchuck, it was both a glass school and also Buster was in charge of a, a video, pro, video and sound program, both of which were brand new materials for artists in the same way that glass was. Um, and if you look at, you know, now 50 years out and all of the technology that we use in our classes, you know, you can really see that Buster was really just as much a visionary as as Dale was and thinking about a glass school and uh, how it would mix with all these other materials and media. Tell me a little bit more about this cabin. Well, this uh, structure has a really interesting history. Um, it's designed by an artist named Hank Adams um, and was built over two different summers by workshops of students here at Pilchuck. Um, and its name is called the Trojan Horse is kind of a humorous political statement. At one point in the history, there were artist cabins sort of scattered throughout the woods here. Um, and they were starting to sort of fall down and the school decided to make some more um, sort of practical housing for the students and for the program. Uh, the artists weren't at the time and continued to not be terribly thrilled with some of the aesthetic choices that were made with that housing. Um, so Hank wanted, at the time they passed, uh, the school passed a rule that no artist could build structures here on campus. So, uh, permanent structures I should say. So Hank built this structure with his class under the premise that it was te technically a temporary structure and could be removed at any time. So he snuck this structure in it was somewhat controversial at the time, but now as these things happen, it's all over the postcards of Pilchuck, and it's really an icon of the school and of the creativity that happens here. Part of my job is curating call artists um, in residence during the summer program, um, and they're, they really have no role on campus other than to make their artwork. We have um, teachers that come in from all over the world um, who specialize either in techniques or a way of thinking about glass and they teach a, say, one or two week workshop. Um, that being said, they're all individual artists with different practices, so the nature of those workshops and the outcomes vary a lot. In this studio, I've been creating some fusions using the kilns back here, and I'm really focusing on this idea of these American flags. Um, it's an element that I will be using for my conchas, which are Mexican pastries. And so these fusions here are for your conchas? Yes, these are pedestals for my concha assembly, or assemblage. Uh, what I really wanna do is kind of elevate the work. I don't wanna just place it on a pedestal. I wanna give more context clues about what I'm talking about and what I'm speaking about. One of the issues that I kind of struggle with is cultural identity, finding my place within being Mexican-American or being Mexican and being an American. It's a real struggle for me, kind of fitting in both worlds. So I, um, I've made some, some of these pastries in non-traditional colors, and I would love to have them part of this assemblage. So we'll have a pair of three, and then we'll have another American flag that I'm sewing right now in my studio building. So I'm really kind of excited. My goal for the past two weeks has been to fill up every annealer that we have here and I've been staying pretty close to it. 
sometimes go to bed like at four o'clock doing that, trying to fill up these annealers, but I'm just trying to do the most I can while I'm here and take advantage of this beautiful space that we have here. So it'll be a mixed medium yes. with fabric and glass. An assemblage, I like to call them. I like to describe most of my work as an assemblage. It's a collection of items. So tell me a little bit more about your residency here. And I know we're in your studio now, um, and you've been talking about your conchas. Can we see your conchas? Absolutely, Emily, it's my pleasure. Um, these are some of the traditional colors that they would be made in, which is an orange pink, um, a white, and a chocolate brown. I've made pretty much most of those colors. But something I'm really fascinated with is um, non-traditional conchas, which would be this red and blue one. This is like something that you now see in Mexican grocery stores during only the 4th of July weekend. I'm also working with a little bit of fabric and textiles. I really enjoy sewing. So directly behind me, I have a part of an American flag that I'm sewing. This is only half of it. I'm gonna flip it up and make another portion to it. Besides just this series of work, I'm also really focused on other ideas. One series that I really love and I have so much joy creating is my derpy birds and chickens. They have so much character. Um, when I'm making birds and chicken, it's more like educational for me. Uh, it's more of me practicing. All the techniques that you see in those birds, they're all right here in front of your hands. Yes. And so to get to this, it's always a little bit of practice work and that's where the birds come in. Why don't seagulls fly over the bay? Because they don't have wings. No, because then they would be called bagels. <laughs> that's where this one came from. That's where this idea for this little dude came from. It's a seagull. <laughs> and I really wanted to make it because I love that joke. This Whenever piece is the last piece I made here at Pilcha Glass School. And it actually, I actually threw it away. I threw it away and then I grabbed it again and I'm like, I'm not done with it. And so there's like a special story behind it. What are you going to do with it now? Um, I'm going to fix this kind of weird part here and then maybe texture it. All this work has no texture yet. I love texture, that's the number one yeah. thing to do. This is a hen and this is a rooster. Okay, I'm sorry. My roosters are uh, round, as I like to say. So do you have any other special plans for this little rooster? This little rooster is going to be mirrored. So I'm gonna add a mirroring solution on the inside. It's gonna look reflective. Very nice. It's one of my, it's really a nice finish. And so we're in the co-workshop now, so you'll do a lot of the finishing touches here. This is where, I would say 90% of the, my work is actually made. Like the hot shop is just a step, it's just a blink. Like this bird is nowhere close to finish. The texture I don't like, it looks too much like glass. It doesn't look anything like my work. So my goal is to remove everything that makes it look like glass and then feeling. I love touching glass, like the feeling of it. So I'm gonna give this dude like a bunch of line work. I can imagine it in my head. Thank you. Everything he has a little tail. <laughs> and then I'll fix his arm right here. Then we have a penguin here. This penguin, this dude. He's on the end of the ship. Yeah, he sure is. So right below it, there's a white color. So I'm going to remove this and blast it to reveal the white, which you can see at the base of it. So you'll remove it. So you've covered it to then go in and do mm -hmm. some cutting, yes. engraving, would you say? Sand blasting or sand carving. Sand carving, very nice. And it'll reveal that white that's under the black. Yes, it will. Thank you so much, David, for having us here at Pilchuck Glass School today. I've learned so much. Absolutely. And you guys, be sure to check out what are you looking at on exhibit in the galleries. Bye. Adios. Bye. Emily, you're here. Emily, you're here. This is such a pleasure. <laughs>